In this battle, there's hardly a secret weapon. Even in Singapore, once considered a model in the fight against COVID-19, it's come down to disinfecting and cleaning, especially in dorms for migrant workers. Where they eat and sleep, it lives and spreads. What it says about the virus is that the virus can find vulnerable places. It's kind of smart. With outbreaks in dorms, Singapore is now seeing infections by the hundreds. The outbreak spilling into the general population as well. It seemed an unlikely development in an island nation that aggressively tested and tracked its few early cases, even using a smartphone app for contact tracing. And yet... We don't know how they got infected or from whom. There's confusion too in Japan, where they're setting up makeshift isolation spots at the airport. The country only now under a national state of emergency, as Tokyo sees its biggest daily case count yet, and government briefings warn of hundreds of thousands of deaths if nothing is done. With holidays ahead, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is urging people to avoid travel so the virus doesn't spread from one region to another. Japan's strategy of targeted testing seems to have only shown part of the picture, and this public health expert fears the worst is ahead. We will see a potential surge of the transmission, particularly in big cities, and my biggest concern is the collapse of the healthcare system. Yeah, how concerned are you about that? Very concerned. In some places, the second wave appears worse than the first, for those who've recovered, though, the risk of reinfection seems minimal. The war wages until a vaccine is found. Thomas Dagg, the CBC News, Toronto. Well, let's bring in Dr. Isaac Bogosh, an infectious disease specialist who actually spent time in Singapore in the early days of this crisis. And Dr. Bogosh, what's your reaction to, to seeing this second wave in Singapore? It's, it's really interesting to see this in Singapore and even in other places that, are, uh, that have experienced the epidemic before Canada, like South Korea, uh, Japan and Hong Kong, they're all experiencing second waves. And, you know, it really doesn't come to anyone's surprise when people start to mingle again. Uh, there's just the opportunity for this virus to be transmitted in community. So we have to be very, very careful that when we do the same in Canada and we sort of start to release these public health measures, we are aware that there is going to be a second wave and we have to do everything we can to mitigate how big that second wave is. And what about some specific lessons here? Yeah, really specifically, we have to make sure that during the time that we are lifting these restrictions, we have a tremendous access to diagnostic testing. We have to have a really uh, strong capacity of our public health system to do contact tracing, to really make sure that all positive cases and their close contacts can be placed in a 14-day period of isolation and support people while they're in that 14-day period of isolation. And of course, we need to make sure that our vulnerable populations, most notably those in long-term care facilities, are protected throughout that that uh, process. All right, Dr. Bogosh, we'll talk to you again later in the hour. Thanks. Take care. And so I can confirm today that for the first time, we are past the peak of this disease. The announcement that the UK has officially passed the peak may be a welcome sign of progress, but getting back to normal will be far from straightforward. That's because experts are predicting that a second wave of COVID-19 could crash over the country, and it could be far worse than the first. But how certain is it? And is it too late to stop it? One of the key problems is that the UK's lockdown may have been too effective. Barely any of the population has been exposed to the virus, meaning few are immune. Experts believe that 60% of people would need to be exposed to COVID-19 to achieve herd immunity, meaning enough people have antibodies to prevent the spread of infection. The UK is now at about 5%, according to government scientists. So while the tight restriction may have kept the virus in check, lifting lockdown risks exposing millions of people again. Could there be an early way out? Many have pinned their hopes on a vaccine which would mimic immunity. Labs around the world are racing to produce one, and a team at Oxford University believe they could have a jab ready by the autumn. But it's unlikely any vaccine will be mass-produced for the public until next year at the earliest. While most experts believe a return of COVID-19 is unavoidable, there are ways to control it. Widespread testing, contact tracing and isolation of those infected have all been shown to flatten the curve. 
Another solution could be a staged relaxing of lockdown rules to protect those most at risk. What is certain among scientists, though, is that lifting restrictions too soon and without care would be a disaster. Our future seems bound to coronavirus, but how many more deaths are on the horizon may be down to us. Of the last five pandemics the world has faced in about a century, four had multiple waves of infection outbreaks. In some cases, the second or third waves turned out to be far more severe than the first. As governments around the world weigh the trade-offs between reopening their economies and continuing lockdown restrictions, what can we learn from history? The worst pandemic in modern history, the Spanish flu, which is estimated to have infected a third of the world's population, had three waves of infection. The first wave was in the spring of 1918, while the second wave happened in autumn that year. The third wave occurred a few months later, which lasted till the spring of 1919. You can see the pandemic peaked in the highly fatal second wave, which was responsible for most of the deaths. Many health experts have said that history may repeat itself, the World Health Organization has warned that the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic is yet to come. But with widespread unemployment and many companies battling to stay afloat, there are calls to end the social restrictions and reopen the economy. Tesla CEO Elon Musk has also lashed out at government stay-at-home orders as fascist, and that's a feeling shared by an increasing number of Americans. You heard Elon Musk's comments. I think that reflects a growing sentiment in this country where people want this to be over, and so that's going to tug against what the governors have to do. They have tough decisions to face. However, many analysts have warned against reopening the economy too soon, which may derail current efforts to stem the crisis. The island of Hokkaido in the northern part of Japan was forced back into a lockdown after a second wave hit the region more severely than the first. Singapore, which was lauded for its early efforts to stem the pandemic, also recorded a second wave of infections in March, mainly from imported cases and migrant workers living in packed dormitories. A survey of more than 40 prominent economists in the US found that 80% agreed easing severe lockdowns when infection risk remains high would lead to greater economic damage. As the debate over when to reopen the economy drags on, the Spanish flu offers some clues. In 1918, the US had no coordinated pandemic plans at a federal level. It was therefore left to local authorities to decide how and when to intervene to prevent the spread of the disease. The social distancing measures over a century ago are similar to the modern day restrictions, such as the closure of schools, offices, and the banning of mass gatherings. Because tackling the infection spread was orchestrated at a local level, the interventions varied widely. This led to mortality rates and the pace of economic recovery differing from city to city at the end of the pandemic. In 1917, a year before the Spanish flu outbreak, Philadelphia and St. Louis have very similar mortality rates from influenza and pneumonia. However, when the pandemic broke a year later, the two cities have very different approaches to tackling the outbreak. Philadelphia was very late to implement social restrictions and even allowed a large street parade involving some 200,000 people to go ahead in the middle of the outbreak. Three days after the parade, every bed was filled in Philadelphia's 31 hospitals. In contrast, St. Louis officials intervened quickly, resulting in a much lower death rate. The evidence also shows that cities that intervened sooner and more decisively saw their economies grow faster after the pandemic was over. For instance, this graph shows how cities with stricter social distancing measures recovered faster one year after the 1918 pandemic. However, cities in red with more lenient measures generally performed worse. In cities that implemented social distancing measures quickly and for longer, manufacturing activity and banking assets also saw increased growth a year after the pandemic was over. The evidence suggests that aggressive social distancing measures not only reduced mortality rates, but were also economically beneficial. While there are important economic lessons to be learnt from the Spanish flu of 1918, it's difficult to compare that pandemic, which occurred more than 100 years ago, with the coronavirus pandemic of today. Advances in technology, global supply chains, the larger role of services and better communication tools may ease the economic fallout significantly, which limits direct comparisons between the two pandemics. However, the evidence does imply that decisive social restrictions to reduce the severity of a pandemic plays a key role in the economic recovery process. So how can both livelihoods and lives be saved? While there are no easy answers, looking into the past offers a glimpse into the future. After all, a healthy economy doesn't happen without a healthy population.
Hi guys, thanks for watching our video. If there are any topics you'd like us to cover in the future, comment below the video to let us know. And remember, don't forget to subscribe. We've heard from so many people who are missing what it was like to dine out before coronavirus. But now a video from Japan may have you rethinking the safety of some restaurants as they look to reopen. The experiment aims to show how easily germs and viruses can spread when just one person is infected. CNN's Anna Corrin reports. Common sight on cruise ships, resorts and casinos. Piles of hot food in communal trays each patron helping themselves to as many servings as desired. If just one is infected, it may be the perfect setting for a virus to flourish. And a new video out of Japan helps show how fast it could spread. Medical experts teamed up with the country's public broadcaster, NHK, in an experiment that simulates a cruise ship's buffet-style restaurant. First, one of 10 participants rubs his palms with special liquid only visible under black light. He represents an infected person who had coughed into his hands. Then he joins nine others as they spoon food onto their plates and sit down to eat. <laughs> After 30 minutes, the room goes dark before an ultraviolet light comes on. The fluorescent liquid is now visible on a lot of surfaces. Items the so-called infected person had touched. Tongs, pitchers, food tray lids, left residue others picked up and in turn spread to silverware, dishes, glassware, clothing and phones. After half an hour, every participant had come into contact with the liquid. Three of them had gotten it on their faces, a visual show of how easily a contaminated substance can travel. The issues with that video is that there's a lot of uh, material which was put on the hands, and so that's a very artificial situation. But I think what they've been able to do is to actually show just what uh, the consequences are of the spreading of potential infectious disease from hands when proper hand hygiene is not performed. Video of the experiment has been viewed millions of times since it was posted by NHK. The joint project supervisor says it's partly meant to illustrate how often some surfaces are touched by many people, like handrails, light switches or door handles. It may seem radical, but uh, I think that video should be put in front of every single public restroom. Many of the countries which have opened up is that the outbreaks have been linked to small uh, clusters, uh, what people call not necessarily the people being super spreaders, but the locations being super spreaders, which highlights the need uh, that people must be uh, having much more attention to hand hygiene as well as to the social distancing. NHK and its collaborators did a second, cleaner version of the experiment, using hygiene changes like separating dishes, replacing tongs frequently, and asking participants to wash their hands during and after the meal. 30 minutes into that experiment, no one had picked up the fluorescent paint. Anna Corrin, CNN. And this experiment comes as more than 100 health and science experts urge the nation's governors to require masks. In an open letter to all 50 governors, they say research shows that cloth masks can slow the spread. And with me now is one of the authors of this letter, Jeremy Howard. He is a distinguished research scientist at the University of San Francisco, and he led an international cross-disciplinary review of the scientific research on masks by 19 medical and scientific experts. And nearly all of the states, Jeremy, will be part partially reopened this weekend. I mean, you just saw our report on restaurants and how quickly viruses can spread there. This is really the, this is the reason why you're pushing masks. Yeah, that's right. It's not enough just to wash hands. Hand hygiene is important, but uh, respiratory hygiene is also important. There's so many examples of cases of restaurants where people are passing the virus across to many other people in the restaurant just through speaking, talking to each other. The droplet clouds that are created can move all over the restaurant. I would be terrified of, opening, of eating in a restaurant where there were people without wearing masks there. And we've heard some, you know, some new information that even someone who is speaking loudly can create virus in the air that lingers for eight minutes. So that creates concerns about people being in an area that and they may not even be there. You may walk right into really kind of what is a cloud of germs. Um, and and what, what do you need to combat that? What kind of mask? Right. 
Great. So that and that cloud of germs can spread out to five meters. This six foot social distancing isn't enough. But if you're wearing a mask, the research shows that that cloud does not go beyond a one and a half meter boundary. So about four or five feet. So what people need to do is they need to cover their face. It doesn't matter too much what they cover their face with, a, a paper towel, uh, a bandana, a scarf, uh, or a, a sewn cloth mask. Pretty much anything does a great job of, dropping the, of blocking the droplets on the way out. They're very hard to block on the way in because the science shows that they evaporate into much smaller nuclei. So we really have to hit them at the source. And remember, you don't know if you're sick. So everybody needs to wear a mask to keep their community safe and avoid a terrible second outbreak that could cause all these lockdowns to start again and for longer. Let's let's talk about places where masks are important. What about if you're outside, you think you're pretty far away from people? I mean, you just described that the six feet is not sufficient. But if you're outside working out or you're near anyone who might be running by, you're walking through a park, should you be wearing a mask? Um, it depends how cautious you want to be. The research suggests that the transmission rate outside is about 20 times lower than inside. So this letter from the 100 uh, world-class uh, academic experts today specifically says we want to make sure that masks are required in all states in, in indoor places, in indoor public places, stores, transit, and so forth. Um, when you're heading outside, it's really a case of how far away are you from people? Is there a breeze? How long are you standing next to somebody for. You just want to make sure you're not in a situation where somebody else is in your kind of droplet cloud for an extended period of time. We also have some new video uh, that I want to show to our viewers. This is the president. He's in Pennsylvania. He's at a distribution center. Uh, and he's the, I think he's the only one there who's not wearing a mask. He's inside. Is this proper behavior? I think I know the answer, but you're the expert. You tell me. Well, it can be said that the president is on, in almost a unique situation, that apparently he gets tested so, so often. Uh, but I will say, you know, we really want to see leaders uh, providing a great role model for everybody. And so to me, that means every leader, whether they be political or scientific, or should always be shown uh, wearing a mask when they're around others uh, in public. Lead by example. All right, Jeremy Howard, thank you so much. We really appreciate this.